Welcome back, everybody, to another episode of The Nonprofit Show. We're really excited today to have Michael D. Dozier on, principal and founder and CEO. And I'm going to add author because we're going to be talking about strengthening nonprofit leadership. And I'm really interested in this topic. Michael, I think this is the time of year to be having this discussion. So welcome to The Nonprofit Show. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here, and I'm just looking forward to a healthy, great conversation. Thank you. Me too. You know, it's such an interesting thing to think about leadership and think about how we guide our nonprofits, but we also have leaders within our presenting sponsors, and they include Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, Nonprofit Thought Leader, Staffing Boutique, Your Part-Time Controller, and 180 Management Group. They're with us day in and day out. We also have an amazing panel of co-hosts. I hope you've been able to get to meet them over the last couple months as they've joined us. I'm flying solo today, but uh, they are amazing talents from all over the country. They're incredibly diverse with the work that they do and how they lead. So um, this has just been a really fun thing to add to the nonprofit show. Okay, Michael, you are in the hot seat, my friend, <laughs> principal, founder, and CEO of Carrington Holland and Lee. But most importantly, you are, in, well, are you a new author? This is your first yes, book. Yes, this is my first book. Yes, ma'am. Definitely. Wow. Well, talk to us first and foremost about your work okay. and how it, how it impacts your life and, and how it made you want to write a book. Okay. I started out, of course, as a nonprofit CEO, executive director, where I've actually had the chance to lead a group, an organization, a couple of organizations I run throughout my past. Uh, uh, typically, the biggest one was uh, we had like a staff of about uh, over 300 people, and we like had a budget of 14 million. Focusing Whoop. on that was a lot to deal with and working Whoop. with the team people. And, and one thing after learning to deal with that, and, you know, it gave me the opportunity to navigate, learn different things, a variety of things, of what to do, what not to do. It was sort of baptism <laughs> by fire. So uh had a unique time learning the nonprofit field. That led me to wanting to provide services to other people who are in the nonprofit sector. As a consultant that created my own company, I wanted to be able to provide, you know, resources, technical assistance, you know, helping them get their nonprofit from startup to the beginning to maybe even creating it getting it where it can, uh, you know, be successful. So as a nonprofit consultant, I take a lot of joy in helping clients succeed and, you know, reach their expectations. Sure. Well, you know, there are not too many nonprofits in America. We use the number 1.8 million, but to get to that, what I would call institutional size, 300, you know, employees in that size of a budget, um, you're in rarefied air and dealing with things in a completely different manner. So I am fascinated by that. Good for you. Well, thank um, you. That that's crazy. So let's pivot to this question. And now you've written this amazing book, aha moments, a fabulous cover, by the way. Thank you so much. Love the cover, but the thank tagline you. is unlocking the secrets of effective nonprofit leadership practical strategies to lead and inspire your nonprofit team. Wow. That's a big lift, my friend. Yes. Yes, it is. It really is because one thing uh, that motiv motiv motivated me to write this book was due to the fact is when you have a lot of nonprofit clients, they're in different phases when you meet them, but they still have a lot of things in common, whether it may be a, a board governance issue, dealing with uh, board members that won't fundraise or that won't do what they need to do as far as effective governance. Uh, you could have dealing with staff, maybe uh, professional development for CEOs or other staff, just a variety of things that encourage me to, to write it, to share some insight, practical tips that could help people along the way if they wanted to get in this field. I think when I started many years ago being in this field, you know, I didn't have many resources. I learned baptism by fire. And in learning those baptisms by fire, you, you you definitely tend to make a lot of mistakes. You learn, you pick yeah. yourself up and you regroup. So uh, I think in today's time, it's better because you have a, a variety of resources that are out there that you're able to help you be better at your job. 
You know, Michael, I agree. I, I, I think about over the trajectory of my life and my involvement in nonprofit leadership and community leadership, it is amazing how much more advanced we are and how many, like to your point, we have resources. I mean, if you think about going back just a couple decades, there weren't books on nonprofit management. I mean, business management, yes, but nonprofit business management, right. few and far between. So I've got to ask you this, an aha moment. What does that mean? And what does that look like? An aha moment. Uh, uh, the reason I thought of that title, a little story, I'm going to give a shout out here. My uh, ex-wife thought of that title. We're great friends. And she thought of that title. And uh, I was pitching titles because she's good at picking names and stuff. And she didn't like any of my names. And I could honestly get an honest assessment from her. And so she thought of the aha moments. And I said, I, I actually polled that among people who knew I was writing this book and and I didn't tell them who said it or who thought of it. I just let them select and they selected that. And I said, this is the title to go with. And the aha moment just means thinking of things you may have not thought of and say, hey, I can include this as I'm moving forward. or I can use this tip or whatever. Just typical tips or thoughts that you hadn't thought about that can make your nonprofit work better for you. I love it. And I think, too, it it speaks to the evolution that we go through in the nonprofit sector that, you know, we we're not all fully formed. Right. I mean, and that's kind of the beauty, I think, of one of the beauties of the nonprofit sector is that we're given a little bit more grace or or creative space. But we don't always take it. <laughs> <laughs> that is true. Very true. You know, we don't always take it. And yeah. so that, that's kind of the rub. OK, so across your trajectory, across the landscape, writing this book, your leadership service, what do you think the main issues are that nonprofit leaders deal with? I would say based off my experience as far as being a former uh, nonprofit executive and a consultant and helping a lot of nonprofit. I would say typically when they're engaged or working with a nonprofit organization, a lot of times, you know, it's going to be the number one thing. It's probably going to be fundraising. Okay. How do I raise enough money to secure, mm -hmm. to focus on my mission, to be able to do the good, the great things that I want to do. Also, I would probably say maybe enhancing leadership development. Well, when you're thinking about that, how to improve and how to be a better a nonprofit leader where you can help your team grow because you as a nonprofit leader you have people that are looking that are counting on you to help lead and you want to lead the right way so uh those two things are very very important i would say leadership fundraising development raising funds to keep your organization alive and keep it going the way the way it needs to go that's very essential i think now I agree with you. And I got to ask this question. Now that I know you led such a big organization, I got to ask you that question. As a leader of an organization, $14 million budget, 300 employees, how much time were you involved in fundraising? Not much at all. When I actually came into this organization, I had big ideas as far as I'm going to do this. I'm going to help write grants. I'm going to do it. None of that came to came true because dealing with a staff that big, you have to deal with staff issues that you inherited. You have to deal with a lot of personnel related matter, just meeting key stakeholders. I did not have time to focus a lot on fundraising at all. Now, I want to say with that 14 million we had, a lot, all 90, I'll say 100% of it was grants and things like that. And anybody who has worked or run a nonprofit know you should not just rely on grants. There were a combination of state grants, federal grants. But when I came aboard, I knew that and I wanted to do a reshift where we could focus on having diversified funding streams, which I think is very important. It's a good sign that you have a healthy organization when you have diversified funds. And, you know, relying on grants uh, is really you're sort of putting yourself in a da danger zone where you should not have to be. Yeah, it's a frightening thing. I think when you when you put in, you know, all your eggs in one basket, oh my gosh, I mean, that's one of the oldest sayings, you know, forever. <laughs> but yes. it's true. When you put all your eggs in one basket, it's a really tough thing to 
to navigate if you drop that basket or there's a hole right. in the bottom of the basket. So um, really, really interesting. And, and I appreciate you um, highlighting that with yeah. your own experience. I think that's, you know, pretty powerful. I really, really do. Right. Well, let's, let's get on to our next question. Okay. Um, when we talk about the landscape of leadership and what you're seeing, how do you see youth versus age and that issue of wisdom and leadership? What are you seeing? I mean, and I guess this question goes to are younger people coming up more educated and ready to lead? Are they not? What have you seen across the trajectory of your career? Uh, I would say it's a mixture of in between because yes, young people are getting more engaged because they have more available resources we didn't have growing up and in stepping into this role that we're doing. So yes, yeah. they do. But uh, I see it as being a mixture because I think with young people, they can bring things to the table we hadn't thought about it as far as, uh, as nonprofit leaders. For instance, they're going to be poor, probably more willing to use tech for fundraising platforms and things like that, more engaging. Why, why older people may have a tendency to think about, I'm going to send out this fundraising uh, list and I'm going to mail it to all the people. Why, for instance, young people may use social media, TikTok videos, a combination of things like that to generate and raise funds to bring attention to what they're doing. So I think it's a mixture and they both can work hand in hand. You know, you could have young people who are doing those things, but you can have older people too, who if they're willing to learn and change the way they view different things for nonprofit, such as fundraising, such as maybe management, I, I, I think I see wins for both sides, definitely. Mm -hmm. But there's a role for young people, definitely, as we move forward. Yeah. You know, I think one of the things that I'm fascinated by is, and we touched on it earlier, and that is just the ability to be formally educated. You know, when I was coming up, you there's a degree in nonprofit management. I mean, that was there. There was nothing about that. Now, the social workers went to school for programming, right? And they were edu highly educated. But the people that were, you know, running and managing these organizations, there was no formal education. Now you look across, you know, the universities in, in America and you see a tremendous number of programs that are actual, they're not just certificates, they're actual, you know, uh, degrees and going all the way up into the doctorate level. I think that's fascinating. I, I do too, and it, it and, and it's, it's important to have a well-trained workforce as you move forward because nonprofit uh, can change when you're doing the work. And you, as a nonprofit leader, no matter how old or how young you are, I, I always want to encourage nonprofit leaders when I'm doing trainings, webinars, or whatever to. Be willing to always get training. I find time myself as a consultant to always seek other people like yourselves who are doing this where I can learn things I may not do where I can better serve clients. And I think if you're willing to have that attitude, I want to learn as much as I can any by any mechanism possible, it makes you a better effective leader as you move forward. Yeah, I appreciate you mentioning that because I don't believe anyone's ever fully formed, right? Yes. Right. You know, until your last breath on this planet, there's still room for knowledge or experience or learning or, you know, exchange of ideas and, and notions. So um, really, really interesting. Before we move on to our next question, um, so many guests on the nonprofit show and just when I'm out in public and you probably hear this, too, the concern of the aging CEO population in nonprofits and that we're bleeding off leaders that probably stayed during the pandemic when they were getting ready to retire, but then they were hesitant to leave. And right. we haven't done a good enough job in the sector to bring up this next level of younger leaders. And, and maybe even people, we're talking like 40s, 50s, right? It's not right. like 20s, 30s necessarily. What are you seeing? Uh, I agree 100 percent with you, because not only that, uh, you have a lot of CEOs just like development directors. They get burned out and want to do something totally different. You know, I think uh, one of the reasons I wanted to get in consulting myself, I want to do something different after dealing with the burnout, because if you're dealing with staff, managing different things, personnel issues, a variety of stuff, you want to make sure that you got all those things uh 
taken care of, but but I can tell you a lot of people are definitely uh, uh, are leaving the field and we want to make sure that we have a, a nonprofit sector that can continue to grow with young people, but they're willing to do what they need to do. Right. I agree with you. And I think that's a great comment. Mm -hmm. um, and that's something we don't talk enough about is that burnout. Uh, yes. man, you know, the thing about the burnout issue, it, it seems like you go so far and then your your product your productivity starts to slide and then it's like one day you walk out and you never come back yes it's like super disruptive it's not like a a gradual thing always so that you end up leaving an institution in a crisis right yes ma'am because you're just like i can't do it i you know um I was talking to a CEO of a very large organization, an amazing woman who has been very successful, was getting ready to retire, pandemic hit. She, her board pleaded with her to stay on. She's like, yeah, I mean, I'm not going to leave and, and bring on a new, you know, leader. And it was a sizable, it's a very large organization. But in her retirement, she was going to get her knees replaced. Oh and she got so bad that they had to move her. And she was in a multi-floored building. They had to move her office down to the first floor because she couldn't navigate the stairs anymore. Right. And here was a woman who was physically crumbling, crumbling. But she, you know, felt like she had to hold on and get through, you know, this transition and you know, by the time she left, she was she was completely, in many ways, ineffective. Right. And so it, it's a tragic thing, but I've got to believe that we've been seeing this, Michael, being played out, and we're still seeing it, right? Yes, that is correct. We are. We're seeing a lot of it, and it's something we have to deal with for the future and figure out, you know, better ways where, uh, uh, you know, we can get people who are new to the to the business where they can be better and also deal with the older people who are wanting to transition out of it as well too. So yes, that's a, that's a, that's a, the future of dealing with that. I think is a key thing moving forward. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, let's, let's ask that question then, because what do you see as the future of nonprofit? Get out your crystal ball, shine it up. Yes. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Uh, uh, I see, of course, I do see a lot of more young people getting engaged and, and becoming okay. leaders. I definitely see that for the future. I also see people utilizing different, dip, you know, dip, more advanced technology to help them fundraise, do a variety of different things. Uh, uh, and I, I see, I see, I see as far as a future fundraising, I mean, nonprofits, uh, leaders becoming more engaged in fundraising. What I mean by that is using creative things like if they're doing grant application, maybe look at, you know, I've taken some trainings on utilizing AI with grant writing. That may be a tool to help them prepare better application to funding sources, you know, maybe getting certified in trainings and things like that mm -hmm. as you move forward. But also I, util I see a lot of uh, the future fund a nonprofit. I see, uh, you know, with respect to diversity inclusion, that's a key aspect as well too. You want to get more people that 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 look different than us engage and and you know mm -hmm. take on this field because it's such a wonderful fulfilling field to get into if you really if you really motivated and want to make a difference. I mm -hmm. see all those different things. You just got to be ready to blend in and move forward with it as you move forward. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you ever feel like you um, hear from young people that are concerned about the economics of making a, a choice to navigate their their professional career towards the nonprofit sector? Sort of. And what I mean by that is typically when uh, a, a person engaged me about creating a nonprofit for, for them, I do a lot of 501c3 setup. And one of the main questions I get, Julia, is that uh, people ask, well, can I pay myself? There seems to be a lot of misperceptions about you know how to go about doing that and and that's a question they they, they definitely want to be compensated and everything and I, and I tell people all the time if you do your nonprofit the right way you, you know bring enough revenues and do different things you can uh you can really make a comfortable living out of doing it also one of the things i do as a nonprofit consultant is 
with a lot of nonprofits around the country. I help them as far as when they're doing conversation review for their mm -hmm. executive director. And typically, uh, the last couple of scenarios I, I had, I've had where it's been women who have not been paid adequately. And so as, a, as, as I navigate that review process and help them engage that, we've, we, I've managed to help them increase salaries of women who just rightfully deserve an increase. And, and a lot of time, you, you mentioned earlier, uh, uh, I want to see the future where they pay women on a competitive basis of doing the same thing that men do as well, too. Right. And I know well, I see went around the world with that question, but, uh, but uh, I, you know, no. those things come to my attention. Well, I think it's an important thing to talk about. And I think that one of the things that I witness, and this is kind of a gender issue, is that women are like, well, you know, this is an important issue and they, their empathy gets in the way um, of advocating for themselves. Right. Yes. You know, right. they're going to, they're going to work more hours than they should without taking other time off or being compensated or getting PTO. They're going to, you know, uh, spend their own resources in the nonprofit as right. opposed to having the nonprofit. I mean, we see this with teachers who, who fund their own classroom materials, right. As opposed right. to, um, and I think that's generally a female issue versus, you know, men that will be like, yeah, I'm not going to do it. And right. they're, they advocate for themselves more, I yes. think, than women do. And so I appreciate you bringing it up because we need to be talking about this and we don't. We don't speak about it enough. Right. And then we wonder why, you know, we can't get these young, bright women into this, into this sector. Uh, because that's the reality. You have to be able to pay back your student loans. Yeah. <laughs> definitely, definitely. I agree. Family. Definitely. Yes. You know, there's, yeah. there's a lot here and, and yeah. You know. A lot. And uh, even with the future, I think offering a uh, nonprofit leaders, professional development training, as you, as you pointed to, is a great way to enhance the field too. And the future, I see the future with that being more professional development where people can be trained. And, and one of the things I encourage nonprofit leaders to do, look at cross training your teams in your organization where they can do more than one job because you can actually probably develop a, a nonprofit executive within your ranks and everything if they're willing to learn and cross train in a variety of different things where they can learn the business. Mm -hmm. And that's one way of encouraging growth as well, too. Yeah, but yeah, I we, like have to, that. we definitely have to do our women right. I totally agree. Well, I, I love your idea about the cross training too, because I just think that's a general, generally a strong management principle. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, we tend to divide off like, you know, the people from programming think, oh, those people in fundraising, they just go to fancy dinner parties and go to lunch, you know, and there's then the programming, you know, or the, the fundraisers have to sell and, and make the money for the programming. And they don't always understand really what's going on in the programming. Exactly. And if they can walk in their shoes and understand that's a part of the cultivation process, you got to cultivate someone before they give you their money. Got to be a part of the team. They don't want to be viewed as ATM machine. They want to be viewed as a partner of the program. And mm -hmm. so that takes time building that relationship. And I always, when that scenario comes up, Julia, I always say it's like dating. If, you know, if you go out on a date with me, you're not going to marry me on the first day. I got to, I got to, you know, you got to know me better, a variety yeah. of different things. So it's yeah. sort of courting a donor and getting the donor to become engaged with the organization and believe in the mission. Exactly. And, and I think that's a wise way to frame it. <laughs> I really do. Because, you know, we need to be thinking more about our whole sector, our nonprofits and our management in more strategic in more strategic ways and so um if we don't have those those perspectives and then matched with what you said i thought was really powerful with the training and the pers and the personal development uh because you can't hope is not a strategy you can't wow. hope for the big donor just to drop you know the money in your lap and then you're going to solve world peace. It doesn't work like that. It, it, sure it requires engagement. Yes. Yes, indeed. You know. If you get those things, you're going to be more successful. And not only that, mm -hmm. ho hopefully alleviate, uh, you know, uh, uh, people leaving their organizations, get the 
your people a chance to be empowered, to be a part of the team, because everybody plays a role. It's a significant role when you're when you're running a nonprofit organization. Yeah. Well, mm -hmm. this has been a lot of fun to talk with you. I mentioned that um, we would go it would go by fast and it really, really yes. does. Yes. I mean, it's kind of crazy. Michael D. Dozier, principal founder and CEO of Carrington, Holland and Lee. You can find more about uh, Michael, his work and his team at chlnonprofits.com. It's a great site and you'll learn um, and get to actually hear about what it is that they're doing and how they do their work. Um, and then, of course, you got to check out this book, Aha Moments, Unlocking the Secrets of Effective Nonprofit Leadership, Practical Strategies to Lead and Inspire Your Nonprofit Team. Anybody who has led a team of the size which you have, which I would define, Michael, as an institutional size, yes, um, that's remarkable. And we don't get to hear from those people very often until they've left or they've retired or whatever. And so... This is a really great opportunity to get the insight of what it looks like um, from that small startup phase to something that's a go and Jesse. I would imagine when you took the helm of that ship, it wasn't like you could crank, you know, and turn real fast, right? No, definitely not. Good. You, if, if I didn't know any better, I swear you've already done this as well, too, right? <laughs> well, you know, I, I'm, I no, I have not led a team oh, okay. that large, but mm -hmm. I, I work with a lot of these people and I hear mm -hmm. them and I, um, I get their, um, honest, you know, uh, opinions and experiences. And I sat with many a CEO and held their hand where they cried or oh, yeah. were just devastated or just exhausted. And I think that's, what's more frightening is sometimes as you said, the burnout thing is a frightening thing to see Yes, um, because you get so far and you can't just like, it's not just like, oh, take the afternoon off. No, that does not work at all. No, <laughs> no it does not. So, I mean, it, it's a huge topic and I'm so delighted that you wrote this book. Again, Aha Moments by Michael D. Dozier. Check it out. You can purchase it on Amazon. And you know our friends at Amazon. There you go. Oh wait, it's yes, turned it's upside down. down. There we go. Yes, uh huh. <laughs> I love it. You know, you, mm -hmm. you can get this book delivered to your home or office within just a couple of days. So yes, indeed. definitely. Yeah, definitely. It's. Uh, I think it's one of those things too, Michael. That I like the the spirit with which you've been writing is it's a a put down pickup kind of situation yeah. where where you need that. Um, encouragement. You need that push, right? And, and we, we all do. You know, we all can use tips, extra things we hadn't thought about, just a variety of things to help us be better at what we're doing. As long as we're always willing to learn, it's going to make us great leaders. I love that. What a beautiful way to end this conversation. Um, absolutely. I think you are completely right. I think also that's that's the difference between a good leader and a great leader is that they're always evolving, right? You know, they're yes, always right. learning things and and you have to give it up to the nonprofit sector over the last five years. <laughs> There's been a hell of a lot of change. Yes, <laughs> yes, we have, so, definitely. You know, those organizations that flourished or continue to flourish because they could be nimble, they're the ones that really we should be modeling ourselves after. I also want to make sure that we give a wonderful shout out to our presenting sponsors. They include Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, Nonprofit Thought Leader, Staffing Boutique, Your Part-Time Controller, and 180 Management Group. These are the folks that join us day in and day out as we talk with people like Michael Dozier and learn from their wisdom um, across the nonprofit sector. Michael, thank you so much. This has been a lot of fun for me. Yes, thank you as well. I appreciate the invite and good luck to all those nonprofit leaders out there. Go do your thing. Go do your thing. That's a great way to end it. Hey, we end every episode of The Nonprofit Show with this message. And it goes like this. To stay well so you can do well. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you back.